everyone. It's Doreen and Melissa. We're so happy to bring this interview to you. This is someone that we literally have been pursuing. Uh, we're about to bring on Brandon Kimber, who's the director, I think he's also the producer and the editor and the everything, of the documentary that Melissa and I have been urging you to watch and buy since it came out called American Gospel Christ Alone. This is the documentary that highlights the importance of following the true gospel and watching out for the false gospel that's all too prevalent in America and that unfortunately is seeping around the world. The false gospel such as the prosperity gospel, word of faith, we're seeing it in the NAR as you've seen with some of the video interviews that Melissa and I have done. Uh, we have to compare everything to scripture because that's what God designed for us. Brandon Kimber, he, he calls himself a father, husband, director, and producer. He's very humble. Uh, he's won local Emmys for his film work, and we're going to ask him all about American Gospel Christ Alone, but we're also going to hear about his sequel, which we're super excited about. Aren't we, Melissa? Yeah, I am. I'm very excited about this. For me personally, I kind of come from a word of faith background you know, metaphysical new thought stuff. So watching this, it was the first time that I ever saw somebody actually pointing out the differences and actually mentioning the history of new thought teachings, you know, with Quimby and then connecting those dots all the way into the church that we see today. And it just, it blew my mind. And I have the DVD because I've watched it so many times, but yeah, Brandon, it's just an honor to have you on today. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So let's just dive in. We, we want to hear about the genesis of making this documentary, and we understand it's intertwined with your testimony of coming to Christ. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I grew up in a word of faith background. Um, the church that I attended probably from, probably until I was about 15, was uh, a split because of something that happened in the 90s called the Toronto Blessing. Oh, yeah. And yeah. yeah. We've heard about that. Mm -hmm. My parents and I, or I guess, I guess you could just say my parents decided to go with the group of people that were in favor of that movement, leaving the church behind that was kind of um, more discerning, I would say now. Um, so it was very common for me to see, um, you know, what people call drunk in the spirit behavior, kind of the stuff you would see at Bethel church right now today, you know, being slain in the spirit, um, just a lot of crazy manifestations, um, that looking back now, I'm, it's just crazy. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Looking back, though, what's your opinion of it when you think of slain in the spirit or you see, say, in Benny Hinn where everyone's falling over? Well, I, I think a lot of it has to do with psychology. Um, I can really remember the first time I saw this thinking in my mind, you know, I'm 10 years old. Um, you know, my parents want me to get prayed for and I'm watching all these people fall mm. and you're thinking, well, if I don't fall, they're going to think something's wrong with me. So I think I'm just going to go along and do it. Mm. And honestly, I think that's the majority. Like when you see this for the first time, that's the thought process that people go through. That's so um, interesting. So there's I, a lot of pressure to fall down. Yeah, I would say so. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny that maybe people are feeling some type of, I don't know, it, power I would say it's an excitement or adrenaline it, it, honestly like I can remember feeling certain things but there was a conscious decision to fall backwards like you know it wasn't like I was uh Isaiah was that was that reinforced? Were people saying, oh, good boy, or did you get any kind of, look, it really happened to you kind of reinforcement? I would say so. I would say, you know, my mother was approving of it. And interesting, like, I can remember my father would never fall over. And she always, 
you know, and I look back, she was the, she was the uh, very um, outgoing parent, and my dad was more reserved like me. So honestly, thought it, looking back, I, I think it has a lot to do with that as well. Just if you're more, if your personality is more into it, you, you might be more prone to go along with it. Mm-hmm. You know? And that makes sense too. With with your experience <clears throat> growing up in that, do you think that people, you know, because they, they say that they have these actual legitimate experiences. And of course, you just made a documentary about this and uh, people seem to trump experience over what the Bible says. And they don't really, they, they equate the two. So if you have people saying, oh, I had a vision or, oh, I had um, the these manifestations of the spirit so they say in your experience did you ever have anything like that or did you ever experience anything like that from somebody else and they you actually thought it was a legitimate experience or you just don't know i don't really know based on what others have told me about their experiences i do recall someone coming to our church to try to basically baptize everyone in the holy spirit Um, and speak in tongues and they gathered everyone around and basically said a prayer and told us to just close our eyes empty our mind open our mouth and let whatever syllable comes out come out and I'm like and we went along with it but you know looking back I don't think that was biblical tongues Um, Hmm. personally I think tongues is an actual language I don't agree with the private prayer language interpretation i agree with you Mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of people take that stance as well so you were a young child around 10 and you experienced that you saw that and then fast forward what exactly happened did you start having some doubts about this did you start seeing things that just didn't seem right when was your your turnaround time Well, my parents actually took us out of that church when I was about 15. And from what I recall, it was because they really didn't think there was good teaching for us children. So they wanted to get us in something like a church that, you know, was teaching at least somewhat more solid doctrine. Um, So we left and started attending a a Nazarene church who was there for over a decade, but that was, you know, they would, they would have called it a dead church, not charismatic at all. (laughs) I mean, I would say even over time though, I started noticing it started to get more, um, you know, livelier. Uh, They would start playing Bethel music and at the beginning we were singing like hymns. Mm -hmm. So I I noticed this drift and my parents, you know, were excited about that. But I, um, you know, growing up in this very shallow doctrine, I wasn't, you know, I'd say I understood the gospel, but I was confused about the attributes of God, how, you know, in, in that charismatic church, the wrath of God and the righteousness of God was downplayed. It was all about grace. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, almost to the point of what I'd call cheap grace Mm -hmm. where, or where you can just, you know, live how you want and God loves you no matter what, you know, like there's no evidence of a changed heart. Um, no emphasis on repentance either. Yeah. Not that I can recall. Again, I was young and it's, it, it, it was a while ago. So. Yeah. Was there any talk in your family? Cause Melissa and I both came from uh, new thought families so we can both relate to your story so much. Um, in my family, it was a lot about manifesting our mm-hmm. needs. Did you, was there any kind of word of faith ask, uh, you know, like a Joel Osteen, where you, you say name it and claim it that was coming in? Yeah, I mean, my parents attended Benny Hinn Crusades. Okay. I watched that. I watched 
that stuff on VHS. I was very familiar with the different teachers on Christian television. Um, I, you know, with family, I, I noticed there was a pursuit of healing through that type of doctrine where, you know, it's positive thinking, positive yes. confession. Um, you know, God isn't sovereign. It's, it's all dependent on your faith. If you aren't healed, it's because you are lacking faith or you have hidden sin. And so I, I recall seeing that struggle in family members pursuing healing and, and the frustration that came out of that. And looking back, it's pretty sad. And so if someone got sick or if they died, it would be that person's fault. I mean, I don't know if I understood that at the time, but I understand that that is, that is the theology. basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can understand that coming from my mother's still a Christian scientist. And so there's still that kind of thought floating around in our family. Mm -hmm. Melissa, you've got a similar background. Yeah. And it, it is, it's kind of like blame the victim. And so as Melissa was asking, when did you, when, when did you get pulled out of that false gospel? Well, back up a little bit. I, both my parents got saved before I was born. And so I grew up hearing about their testimony of their lives before Christ. And, you know, they were drug addicts, alcoholics, the party lifestyle. Uh, my dad experimented in some, I would say, new age practices, Buddhism and stuff. And so I saw, you know, I heard that and saw the difference in their life. And I would think to myself, well, how do I know if I, if I've been born again, like they say, they, they're telling me this, but I don't know what that means. I'm comparing my life to their lives before Christ. And I thought I was a pretty good person. Like I didn't do any of that stuff they talked about. Um, and so over time, I began to get a greater understanding of the holiness of God, um, God, how God's law kind of reveals your sin and your need for a savior. Um, and this happened, I, I, I would say it, it really clicked in college when I was on YouTube and this is a common story for a ton of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I watched the famous Paul Washer. Yes, the shocking message. Youth meth yeah, message. Yeah. And, um, I'm not troubled in my heart about your self-esteem. I'm not troubled in my heart about whether or not you feel good about yourself, whether or not life is turning out like you want it to turn out, or whether or not your checkbook is balanced. There's only one thing that gave me a sleepless night. There's only one thing that troubled me all throughout the morning, and that is this. Within a hundred years, a great majority of people in this building will possibly be in hell. And many who even profess Jesus Christ as Lord will spend an eternity in hell. You say, Pastor, how can you say such a thing? I can say such a thing because I don't do my Christian work in America. I spend most of my time preaching in South America, in Africa, and Eastern Europe. And I want you to know that when you take a look at American Christianity, it is based more upon a godless culture than it is upon the Word of God. And so many people are deceived, and so many youth are deceived and so many adults are deceived into believing that because they prayed a prayer one time in their life they're going to heaven and then when they look around at others who profess to know Christ and see those people also just as worldly as the world and they compare themselves by themselves nothing troubles their heart they think well I'm the same as most in my youth group I watch things I shouldn't watch on television and laugh about the very things that God hates. 
I wear clothing that is sensual. I talk like the world. I walk like the world. I love the music of the world. I love so much that's in the world. But bless God, I am a Christian. Why am I a Christian? I don't look any different than most of the other people in my church. Why am I a Christian? Because there was a time in my life when I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I want you to know that the greatest heresy in the American evangelical and Protestant church is that if you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, he will definitely come in. You will not find that in any place in Scripture. You will not find that anywhere in Baptist history until about 50 years ago. What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates and a love for the things that God loves. A growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, not to be like the world, and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. It just really was like, wow, this, none of this was explained to me before, you know, and it sent me down this path of discovering Reformed theology. And for me, it just seemed to make Christianity make more sense. Mm -hmm. And it lined up with what I was seeing in scripture, even though it was a little hard to stomach at first, it just, uh, it just clicked. And I understood the holiness of God and had started to understand the attributes of God in a much clearer way. And, you know, that's how you start with understanding the gospel. Who is God? If you don't understand that, it's not going to make much sense. Well, speaking of that, um, Brandon, we have some viewers who are brand new to Christianity or some who aren't Christians yet, but Jesus is calling them. And... We get a lot of questions, Melissa and I, because we field questions from our Instagram direct accounts. And we would love to hear you summarize the true gospel for people who maybe haven't heard it yet. Yeah. Yeah, I can do a short version or a long version. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just simply put, the gospel is Christ and what he has done for us to reconcile us to God. Um, there's a confusion today between the law and the gospel. And I would say the law is summarized as do, and the gospel is summarized as done. Yeah, amen. So the commands of scripture, if we are just um, told, be a good person, and God will love you for that, uh, that's going to lead to two uh, dead ends. One is pride. Yes, I am a good person. And the other is despair. Uh, no, I am not a good person. I know I have sinned. And so there's no, those are both damning. There, mm -hmm. There's no hope in those twin um, paths. And so the gospel comes in between those and it, and it says, yes. You, you have sinned, you haven't kept God's law, but Christ came to earth, lived a sinless life f as uh, fully God, fully man, and he took the punishment for the sin that you committed onto himself, and he died in our place on the cross, and if we repent and trust in him, our sin is transferred to Christ and his perfect righteousness is transferred to us. And we can be accepted by God. And I said at first that, you know, we need to start with <laughs> who is God, <laughs> which I didn't start with, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, the God of the Bible, I'd say the best, my favorite verse to start with is in Exodus. Uh, he's giving his revelation to Moses and he says, 
The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, keeps steadfast love for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet by no means he will leave the guilty unpunished. So what we're seeing there is God is gracious and loving and willing to forgive all sin, but he is just and good and righteous, and he cannot overlook sin. He has to punish sin. Good scripture for that, for sure. That is like what I've heard people say is probably the greatest problem or contradiction in scripture. And it's not really a contradiction. No, not at all. But this is solved in the cross of Christ <laughs> where um, God remains just because he punishes sin in Christ in himself. Christ is God. Mm -hmm. um, he, he absorbs that justice into himself and he is also showing his grace at the same time because he is taking the punishment for us in our place. And so in the cross, we see both the love and grace of God and the wrath and righteousness of God. That's right. And the, one of the biggest problems today is people want to focus on one, one side or the other. Yes. Yeah. They want to think that the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God. Yes. And and, and you can see it in the crucifixion. Exactly, yes. It's interesting because um, the, the whole uh, Deuteronomy, you know, where, where God is outlining the curses and the blessings for obedience and disobedience. And, and the biggest curse that he, he has for people is exile. You know, it's getting, of course, it, it manifested with the Babylonian exile. But it's, it's really, like you said, the sin problem is solved by Jesus with the reconciliation to God. And so we get to return from exile as the remnant and, and have that relationship with him again. And that's, that's why we call it the good news. People think the gospel is fear-based. You know, they say, they're always writing to Melissa and I, you're being so fear-based now. And no, it's the good news. The good news that, that Jesus has done this work on the cross for us all. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the uh, trigger words for a lot of New Agers is wrath. And I think that's one of those words that is misunderstood mm -hmm. because when they think of wrath, they think of this, this angry person that's just walking around with this kind of like random anger when it's yeah. really, it's righteous anger. It's a righteous, it's anger. righteous, it's righteous anger. It, remind, it reminds me wrath is, is defined better as pent up. Like it's, it's, it's something he has to release and it's a patient kind of, it's not even anger. It's a patient kind of justice. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to ask if you had a brief definition of that to kind of break down. Cause I can already tell Rats. people are yeah, <laughs> wondering about that. Yeah. If you love something, you will hate what is opposed to that. If you love righteousness, you hate evil. If you love children, you hate abortion. If you love you know, people, you hate slavery, you hate the Holocaust, like, there is a, um, <laughs> I mean, it, it, that tension has to exist. Um, you have to have uh, both the love and the wrath for the love to make sense. Um, I'm trying to think of that verse. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Abhor is another word for hate, right? <laughs> yeah. The yeah. test, yeah. And that's yeah. in the Bible. It is. Since, <laughs> since Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve could not live in the garden anymore because of their sin, there's got to yeah. be this, this exile from holiness. So that's what this whole gospel is about, is reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that I see that you, you pointed out really well in the documentary was something that I used to see, because well, when I was in the New Thought, it was all about power of your words. It was about having, you know, that faith power in whatever you're speaking, and it was more New Thought. I didn't realize so much of it was tied into Word of Faith churches, but I didn't have an issue with that. 
So whenever you're watching somebody like Joel Osteen, there's this imbalance. I am blessed. I am prosperous. Your words will become your reality. When you name it and you claim it and it still doesn't happen, what am I doing wrong, God? I felt like I was walking on eggshells all the time because it felt as if at any moment I can go to hell because I'm not doing enough. You know what the Bible tells Christians to do? Examine yourself. Are you coming to God for God? Or are you coming to God so that you can ultimately get what your heart's truly after and that's something else? You can grow up in the church, hear a gospel about freedom, and still work your tail off trying to maintain the image that you're a good person. 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. They may make poor choices, but deep down, they've got a good heart. And my wife looked back at me and she said, why are you yelling at the television? And I said, because that's not the whole gospel. Following Christ is not about this list of things you need to go do for Him. Following Christ is about this sense of awe over what He's done for you. That when you come in contact with Him, you change. And when the heart changes, everything changes. Wow, like Jesus died for my sins? That's so convenient for me. I don't have to go to hell, but I'm going to go do my own thing, <laughs> which is not the gospel at all. What do you think happens when we die? We're going to be fine. If hell didn't exist, neither would this ministry. Seriously, I would be out surfing. I'd have long hair, just living for myself, but I can't. You, you don't want to burn, do you? Right. Which, like, if that's the best message you have, that's just a crap message. The answer for being unloving is not to be overtolerant. That's not the right answer. Welcome to real Christianity. The origins of the prosperity gospel are not Christian at all. It is cultic theology that has been wrapped in some Christian lingo. You've been accused of getting the gospel wrong. It's a damnable heresy that hurts people and sends them to hell. People ain't worrying about no blood or no cross. They worrying about how they're gonna make it through the day. Is this gospel, is this good news primarily about you? I am a victor, not a victim. I'm gonna live a long, productive, faith-filled life. Or is this a message about God? The cross embodies both the wrath and the love of God. We see that as a contradiction, and yet God doesn't. The cost of accepting the gospel could be your family. The people you love most in the world, you must love Jesus more. But it's worth it. I opened that word, and nothing was ever the same. Go make disciples. That is the call of every believer. I've got to share this news. If I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. Christianity has been built and has carried through the generations on the blood of men, not on the wealth. How can I just continue to live my life as if this isn't true? So I abandoned my version of the American dream and I said, I will do what I can to take the gospel to the nations. What is justice and what is love? And you're, you're, you're really pointing out the love and you're really focusing on that, but there's no justice and there's no talk about repentance. There's no talk about your sin and yeah. your need for repentance. And I think the way that it was laid out in the documentary was really good. That hit home with me, <laughs> you know, and I understood, you know, the gospel, I understood uh, certain aspects of it, but the way that it was explained, I think is for anybody watching that that just really needs to understand what the gospel is, what we're trying to say here, why Doreen and I have the ministry we have, um, is really laid out so well in this documentary. Yeah, like you need to watch this documentary. And it's, it's the reason why is because what we've done with the gospel is not okay. What's happened to it, what these churches are doing to it, is not okay. And everything that Doreen and I stand for is about reconciling that to making, making that right. We've repented. We've let go of our new age, new thought beliefs. And now that we're out of that, we can clearly see it getting into these churches. Um, to move forward though. So you, you found out that you basically have <clears throat> this disconnect from what you're seeing in these charismatic churches. And you hear the gospel, um, you pursue it, and then what and how did you get everything together to make this documentary happen? Well, um, you know, just 
in in the church that I was attending, I began to understand that I was not hearing the gospel every week. And what I was hearing was moralistic preaching, which is what the whole first 40 minutes of the film is mm. about. <laughs> what is moralistic preaching? Um, I began to, you know, talk with leadership and realize that we just didn't agree. And this was all during the, the time that I was beginning to make this film. Now, my, my main motivation for making this was, you know, I started to see the gospel in a way that people around me weren't seeing. And so I, I just felt the need for a tool to explain all of this in a, in a very thought provoking way. Um, just, you know, it's hard to get people to sit down for two hours and 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> to have a personal conversation, right? Well, that's what this film is for. It's a pretty long film. But, well, it's, but it goes by fast, though. I want to say that when I've watched the video, I don't have that sense of it anywhere dragging. You've mm -hmm. really um, taken it with your film background. You can really see that the editing is fast paced. And as Melissa has been saying, there's aha moments of, of um, realizations when you're watching it and, and it's convicting in a good way. <laughs> you get to see yeah. any kind of errors in your theology are exposed. It's it's really amazing. In fact, I want to just highlight that it's at AmericanGospelFilm.com. You can find all the different ways that you can buy the video. You can watch the first 40 minutes with added interviews for free on YouTube. And we've got the links. We'll put it all up here. Um, and, and so as you're explaining who the false teachers are, and you, you've been very clear, Brandon, in, in this video about highlighting the false teachers. I mean, you're not, you're not hinting who the false teachers are. Let's talk just briefly about the biblical basis of calling out a false teacher, that that is something that we are called to do as Christians. Yes, I mean, it's, it's very common for me to hear objections about, you're being divisive, <laughs> touch not the Lord's anointed, oh, um, you know, judge not. How did you get in my inbox? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's very sad and frustrating to see all this because if you read your Bible, that's it. Yes. You will see. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> even Paul calls out Peter for his hypocrisy um, about the gospel. Like, this is something that we are commanded to do. We're commanded to judge righteously. Touch not the Lord's anointed. Uh, does not mean you can't criticize leaders or you're going to be struck down by God. Thank you. In the, in the context of David and Saul, that means do not kill the king. Because now, Samuel anointed him. <laughs> now, I, I'm not, we're not trying to kill you know, false teachers. We're trying to lovingly warn others and pray for, you know, even their repentance too. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Melissa and I pray for everyone who's still blinded by the devil because we were blinded and we know that it really takes God's sovereignty and, and election and calling people out of that blindness. So yeah. We pray for everyone's heart to be softened and for them to understand the gospel. Because Paul does say that until you have the Holy Spirit, you can't understand scripture. You can't understand the gospel. So we are still called to, to, to proclaim the gospel with the Great Commission. If someone is blind, do you find that you're getting a lot of um, testimonies from people who've watched your video, Brandon? I mean, we know Lindsay Davis is one of them who found your video very confronting, very convicting. Are you getting a lot of testimony letters from people? Yes. I mean, they're a, a lot. It's very encouraging. Um, you know, both uh, this has opened my eyes to deception. Not necessarily I got saved, but there are those two um, people coming out of Jehovah's Witness. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, that was that was even mentioned in a, a cultish episode recently. Yeah. Um, 
I saw a tweet from John Piper talking about how someone in his church got saved after watching it. Yeah, it's it's incredible and glory to God. Like, yes, it's amazing how he's used it. Did not expect it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the the um, the guidance that you had to make this documentary? It wasn't really from <laughs> my own church. It was just discovering the gospel myself online, as I said before. But this whole process led me out of my old church into trying to find a, a better, more healthy church that preached the gospel every week. Um, and, uh, you know, by the time that happened, the film was done. Um, but, you know, I, I reached out to people that had influenced me and my understanding of the gospel. Um, and so you, I guess you can say that I was guided by the people that you see in the film. <laughs> yes. One of the things that um, often comes up is, is, is the false gospel uh, a salvic issue or not? I mean, is it something that if you're following the false gospel that could prevent you from being saved? Yes, I mean, there are some gospel essentials that if you have wrong, you are outside of the historic Christian faith. One of those things that I cover in the film is the deity of Christ. Mm -hmm. And Bill Johnson and Todd White preach what's called canonic theology. And this is really tricky um, kenosis is a Greek word that means um, to empty. Um, in Philippians, there's a verse about Christ emptying himself or humbling himself, taking on the, the form of a servant and was obedient to death on a cross. And they'll, they'll, they'll take that verse and say that in the incarnation of Christ, he emptied himself of all divinity, every bit of divinity and deity, and lived his life, his sinless life, and did all his miracles as a man in right relationship with God, mm -hmm. not as God. So That's as a man way. only. Yeah. So if, you're, if your salvation hasn't been accomplished by a Jesus who is both fully and truly God and fully and truly man, you're still lost mm -hmm. if you leave out the fully God part. Um, you know, you, your, your sins and, you know, I guess you could say the wrath that Jesus absorbed could not have been absorbed by a, a mere human. Right. Um, the reason the blood of Christ is so valuable <laughs> and can cover an infinite debt of your sin is because he is the infinite eternal God, mm -hmm. man, God, man. Yeah. And if he is not God, then you still have to pay for your own sin. With, with them, with this belief with them, when do they believe that he became God again? Was it after his, after the death, after the crucifixion? I would say in the resurrection, they'll claim that Jesus was born again in hell. I mean, they, they teach that Jesus went to hell and suffered in hell, which is unbiblical. I know that uh, Hagen and Copeland taught this. I'm, I would assume E.W. Kenyon, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, but they're teaching that Christ had to continue to pay for your sin in hell when scripture and Christ clearly says it is finished at the cross. Yeah, uh, today I'll see you in paradise. Hello. All it says in scripture is Christ proclaimed victory to the spirits that were imprisoned. Yeah. You can't take that to say that he was tortured in hell. Um, and they'll also say that he literally took, became sin, took on a sin nature, died spiritually and had to be reborn in hell so they're basically saying he ceased to be um i guess you could say 
God and was reborn. Like God cannot cease to be God. That so, makes me want to cry. Um, it's just, it's so clearly unbiblical and the lost sheep who are being misled by these false shepherds. It's just, I'm so happy that you're doing this American gospel Christ alone. And then your sequel to help people to understand that kenosis is not biblical and that it's actually blasphemy and that it could interfere with your salvation. So this is something that's very serious to take a look at. Yeah. What well, the consequences for this, because, uh, because I did come from a new thought background, which I call the stepsister of new age. <laughs> it's like the same thing, but it's not there. There's a lot of things I'm learning about NAR. I didn't even know what that was until last year. And so uh, there's just many dots that I'm connecting. And this is one of them, this belief that Jesus just ceased to be God on earth. And one of the things I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around is the consequences of that. So if you believe that he just ceased being God and was a man, it reminds me of the little God doctrine Mm -hmm. where you could be perfect that's kind of what's going on in my head right now is that the consequence for this belief is that people would believe that, that they could actually acquire a type of sinless perfection. Yes. Um, Todd White actually does claim a sinless perfection doctrine. Like he, I've heard him say that he has claimed that, you know, he hasn't slipped or, or lusted in like since he became a Christian. But John's letters say that anyone who says that they're without sin is lying. Yeah, and they'll, you know, Romans chapter 7, you know, Paul is saying, you know, there's this conflict between the spirit and the flesh. Mm -hmm. There's this battle going on. And they'll say that that is not about a person after conversion, but this is about Paul before Christ. That doesn't make any sense at all because Uh what it's saying is there's a struggle before the spirit dwells in you. There's no struggle. You love your sin. Yeah. Sinless perfection. If you believe that Christ lived his sinless life as a man, you're going to conclude, well, I can also do that too. That reminds me of Mormonism. That reminds me of, because that's what they believe. They believe that they can become perfect in this life and stop sinning and uh, that's the natural consequence of that belief to me so if i had somebody that believed in ketosis is that what it's called kenosis kenosis it reminds me of something i would say in biology (laughs) class or something (laughs) Uh, (laughs) oh no that is not a microorganism that is a it is a bacteria however (laughs) It's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, a parasite. Yeah, a parasite or a virus that's sweeping, unfortunately. So the natural consequence that I would think for that would be this and this perfection. And, but I don't think that that's something that a lot of them would hold to. I mean, if you were in front of Bill Johnson right now and you were to tell him this is what you believe and because, I mean, obviously, it's like you have to convert them to what they believe first and then kind of go from there. Because a lot of them will deny they believe that and they're, you know, you have to convert them to <laughs> these beliefs that they already believe sometimes to, to get it out of them. So if you were to talk to him or talk to anybody who would, you know, hold to these beliefs, would they deny that? Or is that something that is just welcomed and known that you could be sinless? Well, I'm not sure about this. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure... Todd White would not deny it. I've, mm. I've heard this. I mean, Todd White's whole ministry is lifestyle Christianity. And what he's doing is setting his own life up as the standard for you to follow. He came and gave me this blank canvas. He came and gave me this pure heart and I've never violated it with anything. And actually, it's actually something that you hide inside of your heart so that you don't sin against the Lord. Imagine that. You could actually have the word so strong inside of your heart that you never have to slip. People are like, well, that's false. That's not true. Well, you're wrong. I live with it. And he's literally said that. Like, I, like he said, I'm going to go after this. And he, here's where it's very tricky because when he is on stage at his Power and Love conferences, you're going to hear him talk about 
sin, holiness. He'll say, he'll talk about repentance. But when he is on the street evangelizing, he's a completely different person. Okay, let me see your feet. That's like two inches. That's way short. Jesus' name. Left leg, I command you grow right now. Jesus' name. Yeah. Did you feel? Yeah. It's good? Yeah. Yeah, come on. Jesus is amazing. He loves you so much. There's nothing offensive. He'll never say anything offensive. It's an evangelism by blessing. Take this healing. God loves you. You're amazing. Have a nice day. I'm not out here to say you need to repent. Um, God loves you, bro. That's it. Like, that's really all you're going to hear. That's what I heard my whole life in Christian science and new age was God loves you. And it did nothing for my salvation. I was headed, I was headed straight to hell by that lopsided theology. And when he does talk about the cross, I would say it's twisted again. He says, the cross isn't a revelation of my sin. It's a revealing of my value. See, the cross to me isn't the revelation of my sin. The cross is actually the revealing of my value. Mm. So sin is horrible and it it covered this. since We were covered by sin, but Jesus paid a price. He who knew no sin became sin so that I might become something. And so if he became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, then the cross is the revelation of my value. He's saying something underneath my sin was so valuable you know that heaven went bank bankrupt to get me back like you're worth it there's something inside of you that drew out the love of god now that's completely you can't find that in scripture at all Mm -hmm. if you look at in deuteronomy 7 7 god says to israel i did not set my love upon you because you were greater in number than any of the other nations or more valuable. I loved you because I loved you. And so God's love looks so much greater when he sets it upon people who are unlovely. That's right. <laughs> While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. It, it wasn't because of any merit in us that caused the love of God. If you believe that, then grace is destroyed. Our sovereign God's grace. That's what it is. One objection to this view is that, are you saying that we're not, we're not valuable? I would say that God doesn't love you because of your value, your loveliness, or whatever. We find our value because God loves us. So it's not to say that we don't have any value. It's just, where do we find that in? Is it intrinsic in us or is it because god has chosen to set his love upon us i think that that's a really good way to put it i i remember i remember having an aha moment myself because when i first came out of the new thought it was a total uh paradigm shift for me to understand the holiness of god uh because i mean you gotta think that i just came out of a belief system that basically made me out to be like godlike you know, I was a goddess, basically, you know, and somebody put it to me this way, where it's just you, you, we have our own standard of goodness. And we think we're good. And if I'm going to measure my standard of goodness to be a seven foot tall basketball hoop, and I can jump and I can touch that hoop, well, that's my standard. If I were to measure, that's how good I am. You know, and the person next to me can jump a little taller than that. They're, you know, a great person. And you know, the person next to me can jump lower than that. And we just create our own standard of goodness. Well, if God's standard of goodness is the moon, you know, we, we can kind of see how it doesn't matter how good you are because of his holiness is just far beyond where we could ever reach. And whenever it was kind of laid out to me like that, I, I started paying more attention to my thoughts during the day and the things I did. And I'm just, I, I realized I'm just not as good as I thought I was. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, I, that, was, that was kind of a shock to me because I, I thought, oh, but I, I give to the poor. I donate. I help this person out. I, I do all these good things. But then I don't realize that I don't take into account all 
the terrible things that I do think about. And, and, and in the new age, we wouldn't quench those thoughts. And the worst thing you can be in new thought is negative. That's the, yes. in the 10 commandments of the new thought is thou shall not be negative. You don't want to be on that frequency. You don't want to, you don't want to attract those bi- vibrations to exactly, you. Exactly. Because we create through our thoughts. And yes. so ipso facto, if you ever saw your sinful thoughts, you would create them. One thing you mentioned before about was the things that people ask you and the things that you get about this documentary. One thing that I have seen, not a lot, but I wanted to ask you about because uh, you do uh, hold to reformed theology. Correct. Yes. So a a lot of people are wondering if it's, you know, a, a, a form of Calvinist propaganda or if that's just something that you're trying to push in the documentary is Reformed theology. I personally didn't see that, being somebody who doesn't necessarily hold to Reformed theology. I'm rather agnostic about it. Uh, I did not pick up on that at all personally, but I wanted to know your thoughts on that and the sequel that's coming out, what we can expect from that as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I understand the aversion to reformed theology, Calvinism. Um, I did not grow up in that. Um, And I purposely tried to keep, you know, the specifics of some of those doctrines out of this film because I wanted to make it open to, you know, (laughs) a lot of charismatics that I, you know, I knew that they weren't Calvinists. And I also tried to avoid the issue of cessationism. Um, you mm-hmm. know, I tried to stick with the essentials where everyone can agree. You know, I had both continuationists and cessationists in the film. Those who believe that the apostolic gifts continue and then, you know, that they have ceased. So, you know, when people do, people do say this is Calvinist, cessationist propaganda i'm like (laughs) you haven't watched the film there there are some things in there that you know i i just you just can't avoid this this is just what is in scripture and you know i guess a specific thing would be the sovereignty of god now i don't really think that that's exclusive to calvinism where people get upset is the whole election i mean it really comes down to election doesn't it where people get upset. They don't like that. From my understanding, you did ask to have people that you did talk about in the documentary. You asked them, you know, you get, you yeah. threw that out there. Hey, come on. Seeing you asked a few people and they declined. Yeah. I don't get it. I think is the, my point is that I don't get how people can get that from that film, from this film. Yeah. Um, the only thing I can think of is that virtually all the people who would say that are, hyper charismatic they don't agree with the film they don't necessarily like the message of the film which i personally find rather foolish because it's about the gospel and if we cannot agree on that then we got a problem (laughs) which kind of brings me to my next question uh the sequel i i saw the the trailer for it And from my understanding, you got people to come on that didn't necessarily wholeheartedly agree, who would be a little bit more of a, I don't want to say a critical view, but a disagreeable view uh, from your stance. Can you talk a little bit about the sequel? Yeah, so the sequel is subtitled Christ Crucified. And the focus is on progressive Christianity, their attacks on what is called penal substitution, Mm -hmm. penal substitutionary atonement, which is basically on the cross, Christ um, took, you know, the punishment for our sins as our substitute. Uh, How how could anyone argue against that? It's right there in the Bible. (laughs) I mean, that starts with the, the lamb in Exodus. So I don't get how they could argue with that what what scriptural basis do they say that he was not substitutionary sacrifice well that's the problem is they're not starting with the foundation that scripture is their authority um Uh, um, they're viewing the old testament as 
progressive revelation or like almost an evolution of what man has thought about God throughout history. So the Old Testament is, you know, we see the fighting, angry, jealous God, and the New Testament is just a better understanding of what God. But wait, Second Timothy 3.16 which is in the New Testament, says that all scripture, all, not just the New Testament, is God-breathed. So <laughs> exactly. how, are they just, say they just skimmed it's, over that part? Just really just picking and choosing and this postmodern mindset where post-modern how, can, how can we know anything for certain? <laughs> the skepticism that is, uh, that's all behind the doubts um and at the core they don't like god and his justice that is the the core issue there okay they they Um, want to party and they don't want to be called out on it they want teddy bear jesus yeah great that you're doing this though you know i mean when does the sequel come out well this fall i can't give any specific dates (laughs) Fall, fall 2019 yes As you were saying, I did reach out to people who I disagreed with. And one um, is a guy named Tony Jones who wrote a book called Did God Kill Jesus? He's kind of one of the leaders in this progressive or what they would call emergent church that happened in the 90s and 2000s. Rob Bell is one of the people that I would say is included in that camp. Yeah. Um, you know, his, his book, his famous book, Love Wins, came out in 2011 and stirred up a whole controversy about hell um, and universalism. Um, so I have Tony in there arguing against what I would say is the biblical view of the cross. And so, and I think it's very interesting to have this almost in like a debate style format where I think it'll be really helpful for people to see what the other side is saying and how you would respond to their objections. Yes. Um, There's also a guy named Bart Campolo, who um, he is the son of Tony Campolo. Uh, who is a famous progressive, uh, I don't know if I'd say pastor. He was like the spiritual advisor to Bill Clinton at the time. Wow. And uh, so Bart grew up in progressive Christianity and now is, um, I'd say, an atheist. He called himself, uh, what is the phrase, a secular humanist chaplain. I have a lot of respect for these guys that they were willing to sit down and just talk with me even though we disagreed and I think it'll be uh, very compelling Mm -hmm. um, just to hear their stories and what they object to in the biblical gospel and hopefully like just maybe the inclusion of them will bring in a bigger audience that you know people in, in that progressive camp that really they're viewing the gospel. It essentially just becomes love God, love people. Let's make the world a better place. Which is new age, by the way, <laughs> and new thought. Yeah. And, and, you know, so one of the reasons that Melissa and I make these videos, Brandon, is because we are uh, really encouraging people to read and study the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, could you speak about biblical illiteracy and what you see the ramifications of people not reading the Bible are? Well, that's a big, (laughs) that's a big topic. I mean, in preaching, you know, preaching becomes man-centered, motivational uh, preaching where it's all about you and what you can do to achieve your dreams. And (laughs) I could go on and on, but when you don't see that the Bible is about Jesus and it's a story about a God who saves a God who is both gracious and, and, and just, and that is throughout the entire, both 
Old and New Testament. Yes. It just becomes a book about morality. Um, if you are rejecting these really hard, offensive truths, you know, about a God who had to die in your place for your sin, you're left with a Jesus who is just dying as a moral example. Uh, you know, he, he, here's how he was loving. Uh, now you be loving. <laughs> One thing that I forgot to mention, there is a new age aspect to this. There's a guy named Richard Rohr. Oh, yes. I Abraham's. would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be a big focus in this film because he is, I would say, the inspiration of Rob Bell and a, like every major progressive uh, celebrity Christian today, hmm. Richard Rohr as um, their mentor, their, their spiritual father. Now, this is something that is so important because it seems like wherever I go, Christians are talking about their Enneagram numbers. And you, you also know our friend Mar Marcia Montenegro. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, she's written and studied this extensively, showing the occultic roots of the Enneagram. And so then I talk to Christians about that, and they say, well, so what? It's, it's biblically, uh, it, you, can, you can see in scripture that this is upheld, and, and it doesn't offend um, God in any way. So are, are you going head on with the Enneagram? I hope, I hope, I hope. Well, I don't really know if it'll make it into, you know, the narrative of, of the second film. It could be an extra, mm. like I, I did, I, when I did the interview with Marsha, I told her you can talk about the Enneagram and uh, I made a video, which is now on YouTube. Yeah. We're very concerned about the Enneagram in, in being kind of just this underhanded under the radar infiltration into Christian churches. Yeah. It's, it's, really, it's 11. New age. It's uh, basically came about through automatic writing. Not Christianity, not Christian. When I think of progressive Christianity, or I think about uh, postmodern churches, I think megachurch. Is that accurate? I don't know if I would say megachurch. When you think back to the 90s, like the 90s, 2000s, this movement called the emergent church emergent movement church. was reacting against mega churches and churches that were acting like big business. And so their idea was let's rethink church. Let's have it on, you know, let's have couches in, the, <laughs> at, you know, uh, in a coffee house, let's make it more attractive and not only did they question the methods, but they started to question the doctrine and theology. So they started questioning the gospel. Is the Bible the, the word of God? How can we know that? You know, everything about the atonement, hell, the attributes of God. So I don't necessarily connect it with mega churches other than this is something that I would say they rightly reacted against. Like they would, would also be opposed to the prosperity gospel, I would say. Okay. But they're going to another error on the other side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. They're re often reacting against legalism to cheap grace or antinomianism, which is against the law. Like, uh, I can live however I want and God is going to forgive me. He's gracious. And so with someone like Richard Rohr, he is a universalist. Everyone is already in Christ. Um, there's no need for an atonement. You know, we're all going to heaven. <laughs> um, he takes Jesus Christ and separates Christ from Jesus and he says, Christ is, you could, the quote he has on his website is almost like Jesus is holding 
the kite and the kite is Christ, this big banner in the sky. And people hmm. can see Christ and recognize the Christ without knowing who is holding the kite, who is Jesus. Hmm. So he's opening up the exclusive, you know, claims of um, Jesus in scripture and saying, you know, you can follow any religion and still know the Christ and still be in Christ. Mm. And th- and this is something that you break down a little bit more in the sequel to my understanding. Yeah. Marsha has done a, a ton of uh, research on it. So yes, she has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you also tell us who else will be some of the, the Christian experts that you're bringing in some of the pastors, for instance, will Paul Washer be back? Will James White be there? Uh, many of the same people from the first film, you'll, you'll okay. definitely hear more Paul Washer. Yes. Uh, my Bodie favorite. Bauckham. Oh, wow. I love his work. Oh, good. Um, John MacArthur will be in there more. He was in the first for like 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so a lot of the same people, um, there's some some new faces. Uh, Elisa Childers. I don't know oh yeah. She is. Um, she talks a lot about progressive Christianity, so she'll be in it. Marsha Montenegro. Um, yeah. Great. We cannot wait. So Brandon, yeah. can we pre-order your sequel right now? You can pre-order uh, the DVD. Um, Really, it's just to help us <laughs> in a way with costs. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it's not, you know, you won't get the disc until um, it gets released. Okay. Really say AmericanGospelFilms.com. That's good to know, though, because I, I wouldn't mind pre-ordering this because yeah. I know I'll be watching it a few yeah, times. We want to support you. And we, yeah. <clears throat> again, we want to urge everyone to watch American Gospel Christ Alone it's something that is different than any documentary that Melissa and I have ever seen. Mm-hmm. It's so powerful. And it's, I found for myself, I watched the YouTube video first before watching the whole video, the whole documentary. And I found that the whole documentary just, it, it was such a more satisfying experience. I and mean, I loved the, that you're giving it away for free on YouTube, but it's not enough. You know, it's just, it's kind of like a taste watching the whole documentary as a whole other uh, and very enjoyable experience. It's something you want to watch with your loved ones as well and your your ministry partners. Um, some churches that I know are actually showing the video. Mm-hmm. You have a licensing package, right, Brandon, where churches can show it, which yeah. would be great if many many churches showed it. I, I can't I can't tell you guys enough how you need to watch this documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, on Instagram, me and Doreen are very vocal about this. It's a very good clear way for you to understand the gospel and a lot of our following is new agers and ex-new agers and they have no idea what the gospel is and this is a very good way a very clear way that it's explained so please go watch it it will be worth your time totally it'll help you to avoid false teachers too because if you're like melissa and i you're done with being deceived (laughs) we were deceived in the new age new thought we don't want to go through that again so american gospel christ alone helps us to delineate who the false teachers are and who are solid biblically based teachers brandon thank you again so much for being on with us i know that your time is so valuable and i just want to thank you so much for coming on with us do you mind praying out our video today yeah, I could do that. Father, we, we thank you so much for your son and the work you've done to save us, your grace and, and your justice, your love for us. Um, we just pray that anyone who is watching this right now who has questions about who you are, that you would open their eyes, just be gracious to them. We thank you for uh, Melissa and Doreen's ministry, and we just pray that you'd continue to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Brandon. Amen. You're welcome.